Good afternoon and welcome to the maiden edition of this Proxy Top Leadership Series. My name is Chinedum Chijoke. I oversee Proxy's operations in Africa. I want to say a warm welcome to all of us and a warm welcome to our panelists who actually came on a lot earlier. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. About a year and a half also ago, we all woke up to the pandemic. Virus ravaging the entire globe. And I think about a year, about a year now, so we, Nigeria went into lockdown. The way we do business completely changed, the way we live completely changed. And of course, for the consumer, there are lots of implications, far reaching implications around personal finance, health, and food security. And for companies in the FMCG space, because this webinar is focused on FMCG space around consumer connections and engagement. For companies in this space, and of course, other companies who provide services to the consumers, there are lots of questions around how to carry on with business. With the changing dynamics of the consumer behavior and the increase in the cost of doing business, cost of production, you know, the question around how do you continue to engage the consumer profitably. Uh, now all of us have our eyes glued on some device. Many companies never knew they could move 80% or more of their operations, you know, remote, start doing it remotely. Um, the way we do things are family changing, of course. Many things have moved online. So the way we engage consumers um, within the within the changes that we've seen in the environment um, have also, also changed. And so there's a need for us or for companies to begin to think, how do we continue to engage these consumers profitably, provide services and um, deal with all the other challenges that have the pandemic and have presented to individuals and to companies. And as a company, we talk that um, we'll put together a, a webinar of this nature to be able to start dealing with some of these issues and engage industry experts to air your views. So this is the maiden edition of this Proxio Total Leadership Series, question on FMCG. So it means that before the end of the year, there will be other webinars coming your way. So look out for them. Um, once again, you're welcome. We've put together experts, seasoned executives, who if you put together their experience together, probably looking somewhere between 80 to 100 days of experience. Um, we have in the house today in the FMCG space to take um, very take a different look or take different you know um, take different different styles at, at, at consumer connections and you know consumer engagement in the FMCG space and we have you know Dr. Ekachi on the, on the board we have Mr. Oludare Kafara, Mr. Larry Abisa, Mr. Biodo Adibro who who are here at very great personal sacrifice um, to just to make sure that this webinar is a success and let them share their own experience haven't been in the FMCG space for, for quite some time. These are seasoned top executives with vast experience in FMCG space. So once again, you're welcome. It's my pleasure to welcome all of us and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the day. And to help us and call the, the next session where we'll be taking presentations from our panelists and then the Q&A is our head of sales, Ola Olua Ayesa. He will take it up from here. Ola Olua, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Chinedum, and good day, everyone, from wherever you're joining across the globe. Um, so this is Brox's maiden edition of the Thought Leadership Industry um, Series. And um, the maiden edition is focused on the FMCG industry. Um, so quickly, I would like to introduce a, um, a set of panelists, um, just like Chinedum has said, um, notable industry experts that have gathered years of experience managing brands and also turning around organizations. Um, so in no particular order, I would like to first um, introduce Dr. Onye Kachi um, Onubogu. Um, he holds a bachelor in physics from the University of Joss, and he also has an MBA from the Gordon Institute of um, Business Sciences from the University, University of Pretoria in South Africa, um, an advanced management program certificate from the Watson Business School of the University of Pennsylvania and a doctoral certificate um, candidate at the Swiss Business School in Zurich, um, Switzerland. Um, Dr. Oye Kachi's career is a collage of innovative strides, um, ranging from product innovation to marketing communications development, and he's been able to build enduring household brands all across Africa, 
is what and built enduring brand for um, PNG, that's Proton Gamble in Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa. It's also worked with Diageo across Africa, Kimberly Clark um, for, in South Africa as well. And also with a private equity firm called Prosperity Capital Management um, based in South Africa. Dr. Onubogu has um, is also led conceptualization and commercialization of major Africa brands for Promacido and also the TGI Group, um, which is a major player both in the agricultural, food and consumer businesses in Africa. Until recently, he was the CEO of Fruita Juice and Services, and he currently serves on the board of several companies within and um, outside Nigeria. He is also an alumni of the Watson Business School. He's also a former executive member of the Advertisers Association of Nigeria. He served as a member of the marketing committee um, of the Nigerian Olympics Committee for the London 2012 Olympics. He is a fellow and council member of the National Institute of Marketing of Nigeria. Um, Dr. Onyekachi is married with kids. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome with me, Dr. Onyekachi Onubogu. Um, next on our list, welcome, sir. Thank you. All right, next on our list, um, we have um, Mr. Abiodu Ajiborode. Um, so Mr. Ajiborode is a consummate um, commercial leader with two decades experience in business leadership brand management, strategic marketing, uh, marketing mix optimization, product engineering, innovation management, and creative thinking. Uh, Mr. Jibrode started his career as a customer service executive with MTN Nigeria. Um, he joined HPS in consulting as an associate consultant. And then from there, he moved to Promacido Nigeria as a category brand manager. He's since then worked with um, various multinational FMCG companies, um, cutting across um, PZ Cousins, AB InBev, Coca-Cola Hellenic, Grand Oaks Limited, and now um, Coca-Cola Nigeria as the Franchise Operations Director. And just recently, um, just before he got this promotion to become the Franchise Operations Director, Mr. Jibarade was also the Marketing Director for Coca-Cola Nigeria. He has successfully managed um, leading brands such as um, popular, uh, the popular brands such as Cowbell, Loya Milk, um, Kano Detergent, Zip Detergent, um, Castle Milk Stout, Miller Beer, Castle Light, 1960 Roots Beer, um, Seaman Shinabs, um, Coca Cola Schweppes, and other great brands. He currently holds an MBA from the Pan Atlantic University, which is a Lagos business school. And he has a chartered postgraduate diploma in marketing from the Chartered Institute of Marketing of UK. He has also attended a lot of executive um, training programs in, from top institutions like Kellogg's Business School. Harvard Business School and Coca-Cola University. He's currently a doctoral candidate at Swiss Business School, Zurich, Switzerland, and um, is a career and business coach and also the founder of Brand Management Academy, a practical um, marketing training school. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome with me, uh, Mr. Biodun Ajibarade. Okay, so um, we also have um, Mr. Larry Adisa, popularly known as um, LA, is the founder and the CCO of Noah's Ark Nigeria. Um, Mr. Larry Adisa founded Noah's Ark, one of, one of West Africa's leading independent agencies in 2008. He started out his career as a trainee copywriter at MC and Ada Sachi and Sachi in Lagos, and then he was an associate creative director at Inside Great up until 2003. And then he joined the TBWA and the concept group as creative director. He left in 2008 as an executive creative director to start Noah's Ark. Um, Noah's Ark has since evolved into the groups, um, into a group of specialist agencies and businesses um, comprising of Indi and integrated Indigo PR, um, the Ralph Wolf Company, that's a creative digital, Underdog Productions, um, that's a content and production um, business unit, and a Media Vast, which is a media independent. And he graduated with a combined honors in linguistics and English from the University of Illinois in 1989. He has attended several professional training programs in the course of his career. He's also an alumnus of the School of Media and Communications at Pan Atlantic University, um, Lagos, and also the Lagos and the London Business School. Apologies, the Long London Business School Executive Program. Um, LA is actively involved in the Nigerian creative community with a special passion for inspiring and grooming the next generation. It was part of the pioneer team that started the Lagos Advertising and Ideas Festival, popularly known as LIFE. Um, he's the current chairman of Life Management Board. He's been on the juries of festivals across and beyond the continent of Africa, um, like the Pictures Award, the African Crystal Festival, the Crystal Mad, um, the Laurels and the Cannes um, Lions 
He's also, he's also served as mentor in the Lloyd's um, Student Portfolio Bootcamp. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome, welcome with me, um, Mr. Larry Adesa, popularly known as LA. Welcome, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, last but not the least, on our list of panelists today, we have uh, Mr. Oludare Kafaru, who is a marketing director for Hello Products. Um, Oludare Kafaru is a marketing director of Hello Products, an African healthcare company based in Lagos, Nigeria, that develops, manufactures, and distributes a range of high quality personal and home care brands that support healthier and safer homes across Africa, um, such as Tecmosol and Number One Brands. That is an experienced marketing professional who consistently delivers high quality and result focused marketing initiatives with in depth knowledge of consumer needs and trends, talented at creating and executing acquisition and adoption campaigns. With over 16 years of brand management experience, Dari has held um, head of marketing roles at various organizations, including Econet Nigeria, that's a Quase TV, NTA Star TV Network, and Multi Choice Nigeria, where he worked as marketing manager, Go TV for four years. As a Go TV marketing manager, Dari ran the Go campaign marketing launching, launching the service across the length and breadth of Nigeria. He has he also has under his belt the Go Gaga campaign, um, Go TV's most successful campaign, which which entrenched the brand in the homes and hearts of Nigerians. While serving as marketing director at NTA Star TV Network, Dari drove the successful launch of the Star Times Yoruba channel, which has become the third um, top performing channel on Star Times platform. Ladies and gentlemen, again, please make welcome with me, Mr. Oludari Kafar. You're welcome, sir. Um, so briefly, before we go into um, the panel discussion, we'd like to take um, a 30 seconds commercial break. Um, Joan, are you ready for me? All right, thank you very much and welcome back. Um, once again, my name is Ola Olua and I'll be the moderator for this um, webinar. Um, so right about now, we'll be going into um, the, the panel discussion and we have here with us, um, just again as a means of recap for those who are just joining us, we have Dr. Onye Kachi um, Onibogu, um, we have Mr. Oludare Kafar, we have Mr. Larry Adisa of um, the Noah's Ark and Mr. Oludare works um, with um, Hello Product Africa um, the manufacturers of Tetmosol, the Tetmosol brand. And I also have Mr. Abiodun Ajibarade, who is the current franchise operations director for Coca-Cola Nigeria. Um, so today we are talking about consumer connections. How do we navigate the new normal of consumer engagement? And just as Chine Dumat said um, during the introductory um, speech, um, the things have changed um, a, lot, a whole lot. Um, brands now are competing and uh, marketing budgets are shrinking every day. Um, there's a need for marketing budget to deliver on marketing objectives. Um, a lot of consumer preferences are also changing. Um, in real time, people are looking for um, affordability. People are looking for quality, even at that. And then there's a lot of competition. So how can brands um, continue to connect with consumers at every touch point? And we also understand um, that consumer connection cannot happen um, without understanding what consumer connection is about and then how does how would brands stay visible and then what insights are driving um, these um, changing customer preferences and how should brands um, position themselves um, for all of the changes that are happening um, so quickly I would start with Dr. Onye Kachi you have about um, 10 to 15 minutes um, to talk to us about the fundamentals of consumer connection, especially in the FMCG industry. Um, we, we, everybody would know what consumer connections are generally, um, but from an expert's point of view, um, what would you say are the most important things that um, brands should think about um, in terms of um, connecting with consumers in the FMCG industry? Um, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, 
Thank you very much. Um, again, thank you for the panelists. Um, interesting when I when I'm called on to speak and I see my orgasm and my friends on this panel on panels like this. So Larry, uh, I, I greet. Um, you do. Um, I greet um, Dara. I greet and thank you very much for having me on this for this Brock Hilton for having me on this um, webinar. I think the you raised the point and I wanted to start with the point you raised around. Um, the markets are changing, your consumers are changing. So the question is, oh, you said something about, oh, we want to get the best out of our budgets. And I, and I think actually that's the historical way people thought about what we do. I, I think the question is, how do I become a more integral part of the consumer's life? And you talk about connections, you talk about relevance to the consumers in its present reality. And if you can answer that question, then consumers become, um, more connected to your brand, but more importantly also, they reward you because they feel you're an integral part of why they exist. And so in times like this, I think the challenge isn't about what you do with your budget. Budgets are shrinking, no doubt about it. Um, companies are struggling. Um, and one of the things people run to once there are any challenges often is, okay, look, if we don't have money, where do we cut? And I've spoken a couple for our people say, the first thing you cut is your marketing spend. Next thing you got is your PR spend. And we think you just do that because you think, okay, I save money. I think at the end of the day, um, brands that will survive uncertainty, brands that will survive the challenges we have today are brands that continue to remain relevant with the consumers and connect with the consumers throughout this difficulty. So the first thing is that you, you ask the fundamental question, so how do I connect in a difficult time? How do I connect with consumers? Consumers are... Uh, you think you know consumers. But the first thing I'll say, and that points to the importance of research, is you need to understand who your consumers are, first of all. Who are they? What are they going through? Where are they? What are their current expectations from your brands and um, your organization, as case may be? 20 years ago, consumers expected very little from you. Um, and Larry would have said when he started his career, you put anything on ad, put it on nine o'clock news or the ad break between seven o'clock, and everybody watched one focus. You watch your NTA from four Sesame Street, so you don't, you know, watch Sesame Street till four thirty or five, and between that seven and nine, you had where all the ads were. Um, then when local stations came up, seven o'clock, they had seven o'clock local news in your local NTA station, then nine o'clock national news, and immediately you did that. They demanded less. Consumers were told what you wanted, what you want to tell them. And they had one choice to accept it or do without it because they couldn't really do without it. Options were not there. Now, after the 80s and early 90s and 20s, consumers started asking a bit more. Consumers wanted a platform for interaction to check that the brands understood who they were and where their realities were. And in order to connect, you need to ensure that, look, you met consumers at every touch point. So it wasn't one TV station, it was meet the consumers on TV. And when I say TV, multiple multiple TV stations. Move, meet consumers in activations, in store before they made their purchase decisions because they had options. Meet consumers electronically because in terms of how they consume information now, um, you can do it digitally, you can do it on their smartphones, you can do it in store. Then more than that, Give consumers a platform to give you feedback. That's what we consumers want now to say, okay, look, you're telling me X, Y, Z happens. Well, the truth is, this is what I know. Explain to me why I should believe you. I'll give you a good, a, a real time example that happened um, two days ago. So I, I met this consumer, this lady, and she says to me, oh, I'm, and this is not even consumer goods, this is medical. She says to me, oh, my doctor says, by this, drug for um, B high BP. And I said to her, that's fine. The first thing I did, and I'm not a pharmacist, was to take the drug and go Google and find out what does the drug do? How does it react? And I did that. And I came back to her and said, well, you know, from what I read, this drug is good, but it's, it's, they have, it has a high chance of giving you um, liver problems in future if you take it consistently for a long term. Long term. You should go and ask your doctor that you should take this. And she went back to her and said, I'm not going to take this drug because of X, Y, Z. What did the doctor say? Oh, okay, fine. I understand. And changed it to something else. The point is, the gone are the days when consumers were told what you wanted to tell them. And it doesn't matter whether in the consumer space 
or in the in the um, like I said medical space where you go and tell them take this and they had no choice. Consumers are more demanding today from brands, from organizations, from governments, and they want their expectations to be met. And if you cannot meet that expectation, they will move to something else. So the question boils down to how do you communicate in the consumer good space? The first point is about understanding. And I dare say the biggest problem we have in the consumer goods business is that we think our consumers remain static. But our desires to grow our revenues and profits is what keeps growing, evolves. The same way you want to grow year on year for your brands, grow on year to equity scores, grow year on year on your profitability. That is the same way the consumers want to grow year on year the great value they get from your brands. Consumers are demanding value. And value isn't cheap. Value is two things, getting better products at cheaper prices. So consumers are not demanding give me cheap products. They are demanding give me the best product in the market at the cheapest price available. And it's a continual, consistent demand. It means that that means brands must understand consumers and evolve along those lines. That a consumer every day wants the best for his, the best bang for his buck, like you say. So the first thing is to understand it. To understand consumers, you must research. You must spend time with them. You must get on the field. You cannot understand consumers because you have been 20 something years in the business and say, I understand what they want. I mean, Larry is here. I've worked with Jordan before. Um, the, me of 20 years ago, I'm a different me of today. My needs have changed, my wants have changed. So the only way you will understand where your consumer is, is continual, constant consumer research to understand their changing needs, their changing habits, their changing desires, their changing demands, and where they are from an environmental standpoint. So the first thing to do is to spend that. If you don't do that, then the premise on which you're going to build any consumer connection points or any brands, um, any, any plans that help you connect with them will fail because you'll be taking a headache for cancer without knowing that you're not treating the problem. So it's about understanding your consumers from everything. I, I meant to keep us from environmentally, the consumer himself, his changing needs, his changing demands. You need to understand it and where he is as a person. And when you understand that fact, the next one is okay. Do my brands or do my product solutions meet the gap? Because understand this. I have I have people here who are more uh, who are more versed in brand building. And one thing I say is, remember what we always say about the brand. A brand is not a product. A brand is a product promise. It is saying you have a problem, I will meet that need. I, you have a problem, so this is the problem. I will bring together to meet that need so that together we can grow. The problem is start understanding the problem. The other way to connect is okay, how do, do, does my product or my product solution or my service offering meet the identified product needs or gaps? It is fundamentally important. If they do not, does not meet that need, or the, then, then don't waste your time. Do not think that I will develop a product that must be forced or pedal to meet a need that doesn't exist. Oftentimes we develop, we innovate, we say we've done it as a company, we've done our bit, and we expect that, look, because we put in hard work to develop a brand, or if in Larry's case, the communication, you know, we, we've done it, so it must work. The consumer owes you nothing. You owe the consumer everything. In this point in time, you know why we say, truly, in the consumer good space, the consumer is truly king. And I mean that with all humility. The consumer, if he says today, I want water, tomorrow I want flavored water, you give him flavor. Next tomorrow, I don't want water again, I want pandemic. Your job, if you're going to succeed in the short, medium, and long term, is to prefer solutions that meet a consumer need. You talk about connection, you have you understand the problem, what his challenges are, and then you prefer that solution that meets his need. That is the second point. The third point is then I say, okay, so if I know the problem, I know the man's problems, my brands or services, and I say brand or product services, can meet the need. So where do I meet this guy or this consumer? What is his lifestyle, his lifestyle um, preferences or choices? allow me to say, you know what? 
I can meet him at this point at this point. Where is he most vulnerable to listen to my communication or messaging? Where is he most vulnerable? And I use that word because there are times, look, if you're, if you're selling beer, um, like Ajibo Rede was selling before, and you're coming to, to appeal, appeal to Larry in a mosque or me in a church to come and drink beer, I think it's a bit, I'm not vulnerable at that point in time to make that decision. So, okay, I want to buy a bottle of beer. But if you meet me at the time I'm relaxing with my friends and I've had a very tiring, rough day and I'm sitting down and saying, look, I really don't want to think, I really need to relax. I probably am more vulnerable to so, say, okay, you know what? I'll listen to what this man is saying. Give me beer or oh, a soft drink. So the point remains that if you understand the problem, you believe that your brand can fix that problem. The third point in driving that consumer connection is to say to yourselves, where do I meet this consumer? And it, it's where and how. How isn't always social media? And I, and I, and I think in the marketing space, the, the, the fallback mantra, now anything you talk, go social media. You know, the question I tell people is that the drive for social media um, in the US, for instance, has been there for much longer than us. But traditional and conventional media, you know, media or communication platforms still are big in the US or in the Western world. So there is a balance. And the channels you use oftentimes is dependent on even the brand or product you're selling. Not everything can be advertised on TV. Not everything can be advertised on social media. Not everything can be advertised in store. In understanding your brand and understanding your consumers, you need to understand what is the best avenue my brand can pivot or follow to meet that need. It is fundamental. So I know the problem. I know my brands. I know, I think about where's the best to connect with this guy. And then how would my brand fit in this connection point? So you may have five or six connection points that you can meet the consumers. But the way my, the nature of my brand means that I will explain on the bridge to and drive that connection. That's the point. The other point in the consumer good space is that look, the dynamism of consumers is very important. You know, I, when I started my career about 26, 27 years ago, we would do a five-year strategic plan. And everybody did it. You do a brand plan today and do a five-year strategic plan. And, and oftentimes, you know, you just, you know, you, this, this, this strategic plan seemed to work in five years. I dare say today, no brand leader or business can tell you with setting hand on heart that I know what will happen in Nigeria or in the US in the next 12 months, 12, 12 months. Anybody who says that I think is bullshitting you. So the question is, whatever plans you have, must, you must create a room for flexibility and make the dynamic brand that is able to reflect or regenerate itself as it meets those consumer needs, whatever the plans are. Any plan that cannot be changed in the consumer good space in today's world will fail. The last point that I'm going to make, and I'm going to before I close this, how do you differentiate or remain different in the categories you play in the consumer good space? And it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting thing. One thing I learned, and I learned this a couple of, about a year and a half ago, that the biggest way to differentiate oftentimes is not your product. Actually, it's interesting. It's oftentimes your, the way you manage the logistics gap or the small gap between the product production and the consumer consumption. If you own that space, oftentimes you can dictate what happens at both ends. And it's interesting because marketing in the consumer good space today has evolved much more than traditional marketing. When you talk of own agencies today, when you approach an agency, nobody's telling you about developing advertisements. They are looking at it from a 360 standpoint that says, at the end of the day, what can I do to get to these guys and in fact own that value chain? And brands that have succeeded, brands that succeeded in the long term owned that space between production and the consumers. I'll end with giving one example. And I, I, get, I think I just thought about it now because we have somebody from Coca-Cola in the panel. When I grew up, when I was growing up, all of us, anybody who is here over 40, unless it's younger boys here, everybody who is over 40 knew that to get a drink for your party, you had bottles of Coke, empty 
uh, bottles and the wooden crates. So every day when you want to buy drinks, you carry your wooden crate and bottle and put that in front of your house. And these new coconut trucks will drive around and come and take the empty crates and replace it. What that meant was that if you did not have the empty crates with their bottles, if those bottles and empty crates were not in your home, no other person would come in and sell anything to you because literally you couldn't buy. So in our grown-up years, it was Coca-Cola, then Pepsi came in a bit. But I always remember in our house, they would say, my, mom, my mom would say, go to the store. How many crates of Coke do we have? That's empty crates, empties do we have? That's what you're going to buy. So in owning that space that, look, the only the barrier of entry for any other person was bottle and crates. If you didn't have it, you won't get into any consumer's house. It doesn't matter how good your brand was. If they didn't buy those empties, you wouldn't get in anywhere. And in my growing up years, I can tell you from all my birthdays till maybe I was 15, 20, if you don't have crates, that's the end. So we, we didn't, it didn't even give me a chance to consume another brand. They own that space. So the trucks will come in, they are big trucks, carry your wooden crate and replace. If your bottle broke, you'll be upset. You can't tell them, can I replace a bottle? Because the crate is not complete. There are 20 bottles instead of 24. They will sell four bottles to you, put it in, and then you buy the drinks. They owned it. So even if a new brand came in, they would not succeed. What happened? They moved to plastic bottles and create, removed the entire barrier of entry to, to, to everybody. Now, I can wake up today and make a soft drink because, you know, all I need to go is the blow the machine, blow the bottle, fill and go. And that's an interesting case study on how you own a value chain and determine what happens, drive consumer connection directly. What, you didn't need to do any TV ad. You didn't do any TV ad. You didn't need to do anything. All you need to do was make sure that guy had his crate in his house. Once now you own the empty crate space in his house, you own his consumption habits. And so these points, I think, help you understand that to connect with consumers is a lot more difficult than it used to be. It was a lot easier 20, 25 years ago. Today it is difficult because we, we want more. We desire more. We want to know more. We're asking more questions. And our needs are changing very rapidly. Today I see something in the US, that's my desire. Tomorrow I see something in India, that's my design. It is changing. And in the consumer good space, the biggest strength to allow you to survive is understanding your brands, understanding your consumer, understanding their touch points, understanding how your brands can meet those touch points, and creating a plan that allows you flexibility, flexibility to react as those consumers change. And then the last point, look at your entire value chain. What part of that distribution value chain can I make unique to myself such that even if the brands change at one end, the desires change at one end, I own that place that you know nobody can flow through. Or if they must flow through, they must go through me. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kachi. Um, I think that was very, very um, a very brilliant one. Um, so just as a means of recap, you've said that it is great for, um, for brand managers, marketing leaders to now understand their brands also understand the consumers, understand your touch points and remain very agile because as things are changing, the days of five-year brand, um, brand plans, three-year brand plans um, will no longer suffice. Um, so that being said, um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to just let us know that we have the Q&A box here so you can start to type in your questions. Um, if you have questions for any of the panelists, please feel free to drop your questions as we proceed. And um, once we have all of our panelists um, engage with us and talk about their areas of specialization that we've asked them to, um, then we can start to take those questions respectively. So please use the Q&A session, um, not the general chat box session, please use the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Dr. Kachi. Um, my next question will go to LA, that's Mr. Lanre Adisa. Uh, Mr. Kachi, Dr. Kachi has said a lot around um, understanding the consumer, doing a lot of research, where is the consumer at? at every point in time. And he said that there must be multiple touch points. You can't just say, because my consumers are online, I can only focus on, on digital. I need to check every other point where I can find the consumers for me to be able to engage with them. Um, so the other question we, we are bringing to you, um, LA, is around consumer insights. We know the preferences are changing, but can you please touch around what insight, I know you sit on, on the creative board, um, for Noah's art, can you manage the entire business? Um, but we know that there is no communication plan that will go out either for any brand um, that would not first sit on an insight. So what insights are we seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, in the last, um, I would say 18 months since COVID hit up to date. So what insights are driving these changes that we are seeing now? Thank you very much, sir. Hello. 
Hello, you might need some meter, Mike. Um, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Excuse okay. me. Okay. Yeah. So again, thank you very much uh, for having me, and it's good to reconnect with uh, people on this panel. Uh, my uh, good friend uh, Kachi. Um, good to be here, and uh, as usual, uh, very interesting um, uh, uh, presentation. Uh, Dari and the other gentlemen on the panel. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, like you rightly said, there is no serious communication that can happen without an understanding of the consumer. Uh, it's not so much about just this COVID uh, 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 period where we found ourselves, but even before now, every brand, every serious brand that had made any impact, it all came from how well we understand the consumers. So uh, as, a, as a business, as any serious uh, marketing person, advertising person, um, it's, it's going back to what Einstein said. If you had an hour for him to save his life, I like would probably spend the first 15 minutes trying to understand you know, the nature of the problem that he was dealing with. Once we unlock that problem and it's easy for us to you know, write on it and write any kind of story as the case may be. Um, and, and more so where we are now, because now we are in a situation where consumers uh, have a whole lot of an array of platforms you know, um, for, for you to connect with them and where they get work. As a matter of fact, when you're not, if you're not careful, they often are ahead of you in terms of um, the fact that now we have a rise in user-generated content uh, where people are creating their own stuff and making things happen. Um, so if you are the expert, you know, uh, to justify your, your expertise, uh, you have to be some steps ahead of where they are. And, and, and where we are as regards this current situation, the first thing we have to know is that we're dealing with a different world entirely. Um, the most common thing is this feeling of insecurity. I think we're probably even a bit lucky in this part of the world. Uh, as we speak, Europe is back, you know, under lockdown. America is tearing a third, you know, lockdown, a third wave, you know, in the face, despite all the advances in uh, vaccination and uh, then all their efforts to vaccinate more people. Um, so there is a feeling of insecurity, first and foremost. And so that's where we start from. So it means that when we communicate to them as well, we don't want to aggravate the situation. We don't want to add to their problem. If anything, you want to think about what's the best way to actually bring things down and make it a bit more human uh, in terms of storytelling and all that. And I'll give an example, uh, not so much for the fact that we did it. Um, there was some piece of work we created for one of our clients, Echa in particular, which we broke sometime last year. It was just a piece of music. And we never expected it to do more than just what music will do. But the interesting thing was the fact that I was able to touch something in people which we never foresaw, as in, don't take it too serious, you know? Um, because the world is on edge at the moment. So back to the idea, you know, the issue of people being insecure, uh, you need to find a way of helping them to deal with where they are by laughing at ourselves. And even if it doesn't make so much sense, like what people will call on the streets, RAS, you know, can RAS, um, can RAS be meaningful? even at a time at a time like this. Um, so that is the first and most important thing. The other thing is that people are not necessarily looking for uh, uh, gaining or growing anything. They have to maintain status quo. And, and in a way, the Nigerian market has been made ready you know, for the impact of COVID because we are in the portion pack you know, uh, uh, economy where every brand you know, um, uh, has some or small portion and I'm sure Kachi here can speak more to that in terms of you know where we were and how we got there. Uh, so it 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 kind of makes it easier for people to access whatever they want. So if you are a premium brand in an economy like this, you have to try extra hard to justify your premiumness because people have choices. And at a time like this, because again, you know, apart from the fact, yes, IMF is saying that um, uh, there will be some. No matter limited amount, so there will be growth worldwide, even sub-Saharan Africa. But we have a peculiar problem that here we are, we're still facing rising inflation. Uh, the forex situation is not getting any better. So, so the, the the consumer, you know, has limited uh, limited resources. So the shelf pocket will become more demanding for everybody. So it means that I must be able to do that for you to even take me serious to say that's the brand I would rather be with. You know that I I stay constant in your consciousness. And I'm ready to invest my little money uh, in your brand over and over again. Now, that on the part of the consumer is something that we have to be mindful of. The other thing to be mindful of is the fact that owing to all that we went through with the lockdown, people have grown more appetite for content. 
content is getting bigger. Uh, they go out of their way to get content, um, be it on their phone, their smartphones, be it on uh, on, 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 on gesture as we see it or what have you. And with the rise of, you know, content, also we can see a new thing playing out there. Um, and Netflix is not just something we know about from the US. Netflix is coming local, you know, uh, uh, commissioning people to come up with Nigerian content. Uh, Amazon is coming, the other guys are coming, Showmax is talking and all that. So back to the, the scenario that Kachi did earlier, where we were all glued to NTA, it's getting worse by the day. These are guys with big, 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 you know, deep pockets. Uh, and they're going to invest in content in this part of the world. So the consumer, and unfortunately for us, those platforms don't even allow for advertising. So how do you ensure that my, I can still talk to these guys? Because the, where, we're, where we're headed, those guys will take more of their time than the other media platforms that we know. So it makes it more demanding for us as people who are into communication, marketing communication, to say, how do I sustain interest? So you must communicate smartly. You must, you must understand one thing first and foremost. Like David Ogilvy said way, way back, that the consumer is not a moron. She is your housewife. I mean, sorry, she's your she's your wife, so to say. You know, we always assume that, oh, you know what, um, you know, they don't get it, uh, they won't get it, you know, when it comes to communication in Nigeria. No, the consumer that we have today is empowered, is very smart. And you know, if you're not careful, we'll be ahead of you. So communicating to them in this new age will be more demanding, especially also with the issue of, of third party cookies and the rest of it, you know, becoming a big challenge. So how do I ensure that I have the attention and, I, and in having the attention, you just have to have the right message. The right message that will, they will, that will take on board the fact that they are on their own. Also smart people who can think things out and they can make up for whatever it is that you're trying to say. So that is a big challenge for all of us, especially those of us this side of the divide uh, as regards being able to you know, retain the attention of the consumer and also be able to, to make a sale at the end of the day. Um, um, you know, different brands will have different challenges, and it are, it's our task to see that they are able to 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 make things happen uh, as it were. So I see this as a unique time. I see it as a time that would demand more from us and and from the other people. The other thing I see, apart from the consumers, is also where we are, uh, especially with um, uh, with FMCG. We are going into a challenger scenario. We're actually, there already. Where is an all-commerce thing of sorts? So let's go back to. I mean. Good enough here is there's a gentleman from Coca-Cola here. Um, so you have a biggie cola and the rest of them, uh, you know, challenging whatever had been before now. And we'll see more of that happening. You have um the lack of your seven going into you know um the hand sanitizers and perhaps even going beyond that. Now also going to energy drinks. So the energy drink thing is getting disrupted more than any other. Time. Every industry is ripe for disruption right now, and that's the reality. Every category is ripe for disruption. And if you are whichever side of the field where you play, you be the advertiser, the client, or the advertising agency, we need to try extra harder for us to actually, you know, stay relevant and be able to connect with it. And at the end of the day, who is getting the consumer? They are the guys who have everything at their disposal. They are the ones who can choose. They are the ones who have a plethora of platforms you know, uh, from which they can consume, you know, whatever they like, and where we will hope that we can gain their attention and retain their attention. So it's an interesting time to be alive, I must say, but it demands a whole lot more of us going forward. And consumer insights will be critical in understanding that because we don't know how they're thinking, what drives them, what is even, what is underneath all of the things that we see, what are the things that they are scared of, that they can't tell you. Like I said, we live in very, you know, a very insecure time, so to say. Um, so if you can, if you can't understand, that, then we will have a big problem, you know, uh, uh, being able to communicate to them and sell and make a difference uh, for the brands that we all sell. For now, I think I'll just leave it there. All right, thank you very much, Ellie, um, for that um, wonderful one. So once again, we are talking about consumer connections in the FMCG um, industry, navigating the new normal of consumer engagement, and then we've had Dr. Yekachi talk about the. Um, fundamentals of consumer connection and uh, Mr. Larry Adisa just spoke about insight and some of the things he's mentioned is that content is getting bigger and um, I also remember that Dr. Kachi had mentioned that consumers are getting very smarter so people are reaching out for they're looking out for content and um, while people are trying to maintain the status quo we need to ensure that we are able to make our brand accessible. Um, he also mentioned that even if your brand is a premium brand 
you need to also reevaluate um, not just your brand positioning, or, but making sure that your brand is accessible to, to everybody. And that for you to be able to solve a problem, you need to first unlock the problem before you can start to talk about the story or write a story around that. Um, you mentioned that user-generated content is getting, um, is getting very prominent. Um, now, so we need to be able to think more and never think that a consumer is, an, is, is a moron. Um, it says that um, the consumer is not a moron. She's your housewife. Um, so we're taking that out today. Um, so next, um, we would need to, um, so like I said earlier, please drop your questions in the um, question and answer um, um, box. Um, Dr. Kachi had answered the question, but we'll still come back to you, um, giving it the verbal thoughts, um, as against just um, giving a, um, a, um, a um, documented response. Um, so we will move to Mr. Um, Oludare Kafar. We know that visibility is also very important when you're trying to um, connect to consumers. So what are the ways we can engage and also ensure that the brands stay visible? Mr. Aludari Kapar um, at the Hello Products Africa. Can you hear me? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think it's an honor for you to be part of this panel. Uh, uh, I'm honored to be talking with uh, Dr. Okachi and also Larry Akram. I'm a very good friend there. Uh, we all do. Uh, okay, here, okay, so I'll speak on that um, quickly before I run into it. I think the first thing we need to understand is what is consumer engagement. Consumer engagement basically means how I can get out of your brand when it comes to emotional engagement. Yeah, 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 also, the yeah, 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 also intellectual yeah, 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 brand, right? And then I think the first thing to understand when it comes to consumer engagement is, like the doctor, you had mentioned, consumer connection. How are these consumers? Where are they? Which is not where they are. What motivates them? And how to talk to them? Your connection with them is also very important. Hi, Mr. Kapar. Also, 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 Hi, Gary, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Um, it looks like the audio is bad. I guess that's your internet connectivity. Okay, so if you can hear me, um, if it's possible, could you just maybe um, disconnect and reconnect again? Or please check your internet connectivity so that we can have the best of your session as well. Um, so while we do that, um, Mr. Biodun Ajibarade, we might need to come to you now, um, talking about consumer engagement from um, a trade promotion and consumer promotion point of view. How do we engage, what engagement drivers, or how can consumer and trade promotion serve as engagement drivers um, for consumer connection? Um, Coach, beyond that, you've already, please, if you can hear me, um, you need to unmute yourself and also um, turn on your camera, please, if that's possible. Okay, I think we have um, a technical issue. So Dr. Kachi, we had a question here. While we try to reach out to um, get Dari back and also get um, Mr. Ajibarade back um, to be here with us. Someone that asks that what influences consumer consumption habits? Um, I know you dropped a few things here, but can you elaborate um, further around that? And other people, please, um, every panel, um, every uh, um, Participants, you can please drop your questions in the Q and A section. Thank you very much, Dr. Kachi. Hola, I'm, I'm on the I had internet issue, so if there is any question, then. Okay. All right. Um, okay. I think the network went off. Um, I'm back now. Okay, uh, Dr. Kachi. Um, apologies, sir. Um, let's just get on. All right, Dari. Um, so yes, we're talking about. Bit, uh, yeah. So we're talking about. Um, and, yeah, and brand sure. visibility. All right, thank you. Okay, great. So consumer engagement, like I said earlier, um, also is a measure of how the consumer connects with your brand emotionally. Um, also, as, as the, how they connect to your brand, even if it's physically. Um, key to connection is basically the consumers, how do you know where these consumers are? I think the first thing you need to understand, even as Dr. Kashi mentioned, is who are these, who are these consumers and where they are? What's the, what's the connection between your brand and, 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 and who, what they do? So I would like to mention here that for you to have a consumer engagement, the first thing you need to do, you need to have a good customer service. Customer service or customer engagement is very key. Um, 
because the consumers, the first thing they want to know about your brand is they first search for your brand. The first before they can make a purchase decision, they will first first at these points of awareness. Okay, I've got this brand. What about this brand? Before they make the purchase decision, go on, uh, they will go and search for information in terms of awareness and uh, what was about this brand uh, before I buy it, and also in, even after they want to give their feedback to you in satisfaction. So how do you ensure that these consumers um, are engaged? For me, I think the first thing for us is, if you're going to engage a consumer, the first thing you have to look at is, what are the different, what are their pain points or what are their passion points? Uh, for example, uh, you said a brand that um, is quite, um, uh, the consumers, it, 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 it speaks to consumers as to um, a, a, a trend, a trendy brand or a lifestyle brand. Uh, for example, over the weekend, we, there was this campaign that was held uh, to meet with gamers. Consumers are a bit more dynamic now. Uh, they are dynamic. What they go for, they go for uh, content that um, um, that suits their lifestyle. Um, if, for example, for a, for a brand that you are targeting the millennials, millennials are into a lot of things now. They are into user generation content. They are into gaming. They are also into so many things. So, how do you meet them at this passion point? Um, I, I can remember, for example, lately over the weekend, we, there was a campaign that was held um, to meet with gamers. Um, I think one of the challenge we have some small brand uh, brands are winning in terms of awareness. Uh, people, consumers, because they are a bit dynamic, they are not going for the old brands. Um, look at the example we gave as to um, when we're younger. If it's not NTA, you can uh, cannot access away. You cannot access content or, or you can't access even even the advert. But consumers now consume their adverts on the go. They can search for adverts on their phones. They can search for content on their phones. And also involve a lot of gaming. So what used to be the norm before are no, are no longer the norm. Consumers are moving to content that are now on a mobile. So for example, and one of these things they do, they do a lot of gaming. Um, the, the, the pandemic we had uh, that, that broke out last year as careful people are. So in order to, for them to keep their sanity and also to be active, they are involved in some other activities like gaming. So a lot of, you see some of the consumers playing games uh, while they are home with their colleagues, with their friends in the other homes, if not physically. So they engage on the, on their phone for playing games. So how do you meet them while they are doing those, uh, play, doing their activities? You can take it there by having in-app um, activation um, while you, you engage with them there. Or you can even uh, take it from online to online. Um, I was, for example, there was this campaign that was run just recently where we uh, we tied it into an activation for a Mortal Kombat game. I know for some of us are quite uh, young, we play Mortal Kombat when we were, when we were quite, quite young. And what that plays this game is that the younger ones, uh, there was this premiere of the Mortal Kombat games, uh, a film in, at the cinema. You go on the offline to go and activate them. You take it from being offline and then take it online. So first and foremost, there is a physical activation in the cinema where they engage with the brand. The brand is very visible. They see that this is sponsored by the brand and they see themselves with their brand. After which you take it from the off online, you take it offline and then they continue the conversation. Um, for one other thing I also mentioned about con consumer engagement is consumer engagement doesn't just stop at the point of when they are looking for information. Consumers, when they engage with your customers, when they engage with your products and they want to give feedback, they want a real time feedback. They don't have time to call um, your call center. They don't have time to send you an email. They don't have time and wait for your response. They want an, uh, we want a real time response from you. So it's very important also you have to make it in place for them to speak to them. And I think brands are basically are begun, are begin to understand this and they are doing now some um, activities or really some um, initiative to speak to that. You can see a lot of, a lot of uh, consumers, uh, brands are now adopting emailers to their, to their customers. They are also developing app that encourage their customers to download. Those apps is something they can actually learn about the cost their, their brands or learn about their product or services and then give a real time response to what if you have question, they'll give you a real-time response. And also, if you want a feedback, I'll give you feedback on that. And interestingly for us now, because consumers also are very are now very dynamic, one, and also with the COVID-19 um, pandemic we have, consumers no longer want to go and sit down in your office and then wait to speak to you. So social media is becoming very, very important for us to engage. So customers, um, um, businesses or brands are now leveraging on their social media platform in order to engage the consumer. So social media platforms, be it owned, 
paying or even the ones that they, they earn. They use these platforms to, to, promote their, to promote their brand and also to engage their brand. The whole essence of having a consumer engagement session or consumer engage, customer engagement is to drive loyalty. If your customers are not engaged with you, um, definitely they, they, they won't be loyal to your brand because a, a highly engaged customer or a highly engaged consumer, they will promote you more they will buy you more and they have a tendency even to increase their loyalty to you. So at the first, of, for any new, for any brand, at the, at the time of um, consideration of seeking awareness, the first thing they want, a consumer want to do, I want to know about this brand. For example, um, I want to know about Netflix. What about Netflix? Okay, Netflix gives this um, about the brand. So what's the first thing I want to know? I want to know about, it. okay, let me give it a try. Okay, I watch, I see what Netflix has. They have backlog of a library of content, be it local content or foreign content. And the next thing now, okay, let me give it a try. You want to convert them from being a prospect, um, a consumer from being a prospect, and you want them from being a prospect, you want the consumer able to be a client. When it business like then they are giving you their money, the money of exchange hands, and then they are the next thing you want to graduate them from being a client to be an advocate. Advocate now means that oh okay, I watch Netflix, I like Netflix. Netflix gives me what I want. I'll tell my friends, have you seen this movie on Netflix? Have you done this on Netflix? Come on board, and then from there they now become a partner. So the whole essence of having consumer engagement is to move your customers from being um, a, 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 from being a prospect to being your advocate and even your partner. So that's very important. And when it comes to consumer engagement, it's very important to know that there are three, three, three key things that measures um, uh, consumer engagement. One, in terms of your message, you have to be empathic. Empathic. When when, when you go to what to mean by empathic, you see yourself in the cons put your, your brand in the consumer's shoes. Let the consumer see themselves in you. For example, I say a lifestyle, uh, uh, um, a brand, a brand like say, for example, our, our brand in, in the company, we have a brand that is um, for, uh, that is cool, a cool brand. A cool brand, like it's a soap, you take your bath with, after you had this job, you come back home, you take your bath and makes you cool it. So the first thing a consumer wants to see is that, oh, this brand actually works for me. This brand is a brand that will speak to my need. You see them in their shoes. It, the brand actually works for me. So once they see that the brand actually works for me, and then you address their issues, that and that whatever problem, the consumer problem, it speaks for them. Then the next thing now is you want your message to be very clear. What, what are the messages I want my customers to know about me? Simple, clear messages without, no, without ambiguity. You use this soap, it gives you a cooling effect, and that is it. That is it. So beyond, uh, you don't want to say so many things. It gives, it keeps you refreshed and give you a quick effect. And then lastly, it has to be simple, clear message and very simple delivery. You don't want them to say, okay, in terms of engagement, you don't want them to go through so many stages before they speak to you, before they, they can get to hear from you. You want the, cons the consumers want to be sure that you are giving them. The consumers want to be sure that whatever you speak to them, it is not taking them through. Um, a lot of steps, so, for, for a lot of steps before they can hear from you. So they want a real time response to your to your to your to, to their request. They want a real time response to their feedback. And when they want to give you a feedback, they want to speak to you directly. You see, and you see a lot of brand engaging social media platforms. So the likes of they lose a lot of Twitter. Now you see that cost, um, brands have actively engaging on their Twitter and do with your customers, you see a lot of emailers and the apps too. So at, even at the point of the app, they, they put an in-game, the, the app goes beyond a, 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 a platform for engagement. It goes also in engaging them in creating content. They, in order to, to them to do user-generated content in, to, in order to, to engage with the, with, with the consumers and also drive more engagement. So I think for me, uh, when it comes to brand visibility here, there are a lot of ways for us to drive brand visibility and also to, also to drive consumer engagement. Um, definitely, um, social media is, has come to stay. Um, most of the consumers are moving towards that platform um, to, for, for, for them for, for engagement. And then also, every smart brand also use social media to drive their engagement. It is very pertinent. It's very important that social media being used. Uh, they use the, their, their, their social media platform to drive engagement because it gives real-time engagement. It, it, the cost of engaging on social media is also very, very, very um, minimum compared to going um, above it. And also, it, it's also very important here to mention that not only is are the cost very, um, very, very, um, 
very, it's very accessible, it's very cheap to engage on social media, but social media gives a real-time response. But in a, in a country like Nigeria, where the, the consumers, we also have the traditional consumers that are not that social media savvy. I think it's important, like Dr. Kakachi mentioned, to have a balance between social media engagement and also uh, um, online or offline engagement. So, and smarter brands are moving from having not only online engagement, but taking activities online, and activities online, and taking it offline. So, while you are starting a campaign off, off, offline, they move it down to online engagement. So, um, I think that that's what we're currently doing at the moment, and I think it's exciting. So, I, 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 I want to leave it there for now. Thank you very much, Dari. Um, well appreciated. Um, thank you very much. We have a few questions coming in. Um, we expect that um, our attendees are also dropping in more questions so that we can have all the questions together and get our panelists to answer them. Um, thank you again very much, um, Dari Kafar. Um, again, this is Consumer Connections, navigating the new normal of consumer engagement. We've listened to Dr. Kachi um, and also Larry Adisa, the CEO of um, NOAA's ARC. And we just listened to Dari Kafar, who is the, um, the head marketing director at um, Hello Products, talking about brand visibility and, uh, and ways to ensure that brands are connecting um, with consumers. He's also mentioned some things around the zero moment of truth, where consumers don't have to wait till they um, interact with your brand. They go online, they do their research, and then they decide. And that you must also keep channels of communication open. You need to also look for ways. Where are the consumers? Like Dr. Kachi had said, um, you don't, there are multiple points to consumer engagement now. Look for every geography where your consumers are. So if they are online, find ways to engage with them. If they are offline, also find ways to engage with them. And um, Dari has also reiterated that and he's also been able to um, give us a few points around that as well. So lastly, we are coming to Mr. Ajibor de Abiodun um, to talk to us around consumer promotion and um, how do we use consumer and trade promotion as um, engagement drivers in terms of connection? Um, Mr. Jibarade, over to you. You can unmute your mic now. Um, so let's talk to us about your experiences around um, trade and consumer engagement as major drivers for consumer connections. Thank you very much, sir. All right, thanks. Um, Ola, um, and I, I think it's a privilege standing on the same platform with my with my bosses. Um, Dr. Kachi is, used to be my boss and is still my boss today. And Larry is a veteran in the industry. And uh, Dari is also my, my very good friend. So thanks for putting this together. We can leverage consumer and trade promotion to, you know, engender and um, engage consumers, drive value for the business. And if I understand and interpret uh, your request very well, and I think that captures it. But when we about consumer, spaces you have the actual user of the product and you have those who actually buy the product so um, from that lens you you begin to look at these two guys set of guys what are they looking for the first thing which is which is also to corroborate what um, Larry said and uh, what Dr. Hachi said is about these guys are looking for value um, they are looking for value even before pandemic started uh, because um, disposable income is not um, in finance, it's, um, it's technically you know, limited. And because it's limited, people are looking for how to maximize the value they get out of that. And because uh, COVID has now come again, uh, um, further you know, weakening the power of the disposable income, uh, consumers are looking for more value from, com from, from, from manufacturer, from companies um, to um, to be able to, you know, uh, maximize the, the the value of their of their income. So based on this, um, we'll, I will speak to the consumer lens, and I will come into the trade lens, which is also a very significant part of the success of any business. Um, 
And when we talk about the trade, we'll look at it from two lens. Um, the distributor, which are the, and the wholesaler, which are the one that drives the primary sales. And the retailers, which is um, the end, end, um, end game for every business, where the second sales actually takes place. And that is where consumer actually um, see. And more importantly, we should also begin to look at, um, you know, trade partner beyond just the physical and motor, motor um, you know, buildings and all of that. We begin to look at e-commerce as part of the trade partners in this context. So um, what are consumer looking for and why is consumer, consumer, you know, promotions very important to engage them? Like I said, because they're looking for value and because they, they, their purchasing power has reduced because of the, of the shrinking income, um, they require you know, companies or brands that give value uh, in exchange for their income. And because that environment and that competitive set is becoming very tense, uh, like um, Dr. Kachi was giving the example of Coca-Cola and even Larry was corroborating on, on on, on how the, the, the you know, carbonated soft drink category has been you know, bastardized in the last few years. And it will keep happening, that's the truth of the matter, because that environment is already democratized. So because it's democratized, anybody can pop in, get a NAVDAC, a NAVDAC number, and you start producing something. And if you put a value to it, and you, you, you resonate with consumer, you will definitely make, make sales out of it. And because that is happening on a daily basis, it then becomes very important to say beyond the communication, how do I then begin to entice consumers and give them more value for their income? And that is the place of promotions, both at the consumer leg and at the trade leg. So at the consumer leg, you begin to uh, think about different promotions. And promotion doesn't necessarily mean that you have to part with money. And that is one thing that I want people to take out of this. Um, consumers are looking for experience and they begin to see the value they get from the brand from the total experience. And I carefully say that um, one of the things that I've discovered in the last few years of working is that the pricing of a product is different, is a total different thing from the cost of that product to the consumer. And because those things are very different, it is important for you as a company to begin to think beyond just the pricing think holistically about what is the cost of this item of this brand to the consumer. Um, you can be at the right price if, if you're not available at the right place per time, uh, then the cost of getting you becomes uh, more, more than the price that you put on the product. And because of those factors, it is important that the value of promotion is not only attached to when you begin to say buy one, get one free. That is the easier way to go. Um, Engaging consumer through promotions are uh, things around, you know, an augmented reality on your packaging that begins to give them some level of comfort. Let's say somebody wants to actually start thinking about music or you want to think about, you know, value added services on your packaging. It is a value that consumers see. It might be intangible, but they recognize those value and they see them as more important than, you know, just buy and getting one more. So I just want us to challenge our thinking or to start thinking about consumer promotion has to be about giving something to consumer um, in exchange, like product itself. It could be something else that resonates with that consumer. So, but like I said, in the space where you have high competition, you need to also put together some um, incentive whether it is um, product based, whether it is service based, whether it is experience based, to start giving consumer more value for their money. Um, I'll give a, a, a very good example of, of, of what we did during COVID in Coca Cola. And um, before COVID, we had planned a we had planned a, um, a, a sales a, a consumer promotion and leveraging uh, what we call it, leveraging the EPA platform that we had. Uh, because we know football resonates with Nigerians. And part of the things we want to do was to actually drive transaction. You must have a very clear objective of what, why you're doing promotion, not just doing it for sake of doing it. We want to drive transaction and we never even knew that COVID was going to come then. So we decided to do an under the crown promotion. Under the crown promotion, 
um, you know, to just then begin to say consumer gets something in exchange for the value they are parting with you. And one of the key things I learned during that promotion was that consumers are looking for instant gratification. So um, we are in ages in which consumers are not waiting. So if you're giving value to consumer in terms of promotion, you have to think of it in the space of time. There is something that they can assess as value back to them within a short period of time, and they don't need to wait for it forever. So that was one of the critical things that helped us in 2021 to drive the first quarter for the business, because the incentive would make sure that incentive was uh, actually instant. And it was something that is, um, is, is, is commensurate with what they have invested. So the least person get like 100 Naira, you use 100 Naira to buy a bottle of Coke. So it's to tell you that, okay, if I'm lucky, I probably will, um, what do you call it, you know, get the value that I'm exchanging for the bottle of Coke back. So we, 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 we took that part because we believe that in a space where is becoming a generic product. Um, yes, we are there, Coca-Cola, you do you do advertising and the rest. But the, the fact is that an average consumer wants something at under an price point. And that was one of the lessons we took from 2008 pricing that we took. Uh, because Biggie was there, you know, the Blue Boys were there at under an price point, and that is what consumer wants. So that value in terms of functional, you know, you know, proposition or promise to consumer were there, but the over and above that, you begin, we begin to look at opportunities to actually add more value to consumer. Like Dr. Kashi said, we will keep seeing consumer asking for more value. Like I said, value can be from the promotional end or can be from you making your product available at the least, um, at the limited, you know, cost to consumers. Um, then that is value to consumer. That's how consumer are visualizing value. We also believe that consumer promotions are important when we reopen after, after COVID because Oreca, where most of our brands um, you know, are performing very well, well, those outlets were shut down. And you know, coming back to life, we need to give incentive to drive um, footfall into those, into those outlets. So we have to develop both consumer promotions and both you know, shoppers promotion, if I have to put it that way in those outlets. And that, that was one of the things that we used to support the trade partners um, during uh, post-COVID um, era. So um, regardless of how we look at it and regardless of what we do, year in, year out, consumer will keep asking for more value. And consumer promotion becomes one of the things that we can use to actually give those value to them. But again, we have to start looking at how we do consumer promotion. Consumer promotion must come back with a return on investment. And so significant return on investment implies that you must be able to, you know, forecast what you're getting out of the investment that you're putting. Because to do consumer promotion is actually not very cheap. Um, then you should be able to leverage very key passion points um, so that at the end of the day, um, you're giving to Zuma, and you're also resonating with them at the point where they actually want you to resonate with them. On the trade partners and the and the customer point of view, um, I think Nigeria has come to a point in which you can literally not do anything without doing you know, discounting at that level uh, because some some organization or brands they really do not have any other thing than to do discounts. And if you say you're a big brand, you want to play a game of, um, of your branding or marketing alone, you probably will suffer at the point of, of purchase. And that is why it is important that we consider distributors, wholesalers who drive primary sales for us and retailers to put them under loyalty schemes. So I, I always look for, you know, attempt to do loyalty with them rather than doing, you know, a tactical promotion uh, with them where they are going to do for a period of time and shut down. But if you put them on an, an incentive schemes that is um, a long time, then you're able to lock their investment into your brand for a period of time. Because what are these guys looking for? Basically, they're looking for margins and profitability. And, and you know, it is trade discount and loyalty that, you know, that they, they are looking at, that loyalty portion that they are looking for. And if you don't give them at that point in time, they will switch. They are, they are not loyal to anybody. 
um, if, the, if the margins are lower, you must have equity to support your margin. The, my, if your equity is strong enough to drive, um, what do you call it, your, your consumer uptake, then they will be able to actually part with your uh, lower margin. But if you don't have a strong equity to actually support consumer uptake and you are offering something low to competition, they will move to competition regardless of who you say you are. We are Coca-Cola is a classic example of what happened in 2018. Um, Biggie went in and they took chunk of the market share. And it's, it's not that Biggie has done any advert or has done anything. It's because they were just there with the right incentive for the trade partner. And then the, the trade partner will push what they think they are making more money on it. And they will force it into the hands of consumer. And that is how FMCG life works. And because that is becoming intense, uh, the competition is becoming intense. And to sustain um, are relevant in that space, brands should be looking at, you know, putting together a very, very sustainable, and I say sustainable means it's not something you can actually, you know, you know, take for a period of time. Um, again, one of the smart way to also look at it is that the items that we are giving are those items that can help you further drive um, your product within that same space. For example, you can exchange whatsoever their incentives with, with, with more products, which they will eventually sell, which helps you actually drive more sales. These are, these are some of the things that we can actually put into bed um, in putting our plans together for the trade partners. But to be honest, you can't do anything without having incentive package for these guys. And the quest for the fact that lost some revenue in 2020 it is becoming more eminent that you have to find a way of giving more value to the trade partners and making them more uh, more of your lawyer partners rather than just treating them like um, a transactional partner and i think if you if we look at this approaches to how we engage consumers from a promotion standpoint, we will be able to win as brands in the market. And I think, um, I think um, you know, the lessons are there for people to learn how, you know, great brands grouped, how small brands have been able to take, take on um, big, big brands by just doing some of these things that I've mentioned. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, sir, um, Mr. Ajiborade, for you also added practicality using Coca-Cola as a case study. Um, before we go into our question and answers, I can see a hand raised. Um, that should be uh, Messi. Messi, I, know, I hope I believe you have a question. Is it possible you drop your question in the Q&A um, box um, while we, we take a very short commercial break? And then once we are back, we'll start to take the questions. I also see a question um, from somebody that was dropped in the in the chat box, which I will um, read out shortly as well, um, from Abiodu Oshi Koya. Um, so, um, Joanne, over to you. Let's take a 30 minutes commercial break and we'll back to take the questions and answers. Thank you very much. 30 seconds. There's no sound on this drum. Okay, I think we have um, great. All right, thank you. We didn't get the audio for that, um, but thank you for for sharing. We have a couple of questions and I'll start with the ones in the chat room. 
Um, we have two questions here from Abisodu Oshikoya. She says, good afternoon. Thanks so much um, for the chat so far. You've been insightful. I have, however, I have the below questions. So for Dr. Onyekachi, she says, I work in the drinks industry. Currently, the industry is challenged with product availability, which is key to brand success. As it says now, production team cannot meet the demand. OK, yes, production team cannot meet the demand. How then would branding team connect or communicate with its consumers, considering any communication will spike demand, which production cannot upscale to presently? And consumer connection and communication is key. So she's saying that even if you push any form of communication to what is the minimum I can do to just keep my brand in the minds of consumers as we navigate the supply challenges? And that's the key thing. It is never, uh, the, the easiest solution is cut out everything. We don't have we don't have product, cut out everything. The point is when you cut out everything and somebody occupies the mind of that consumer, maybe by the time you come back, you realize that some of those guys who couldn't get your products have shifted. So the challenge for me will be, look, if there's no product, you cannot be just doing advertising, spending millions of dollars because then there's no product. But you also don't go away. The question you'll ask yourself as a great marketing or competition person, what can I do to remain relevant in the mind of the consumer? So that when my products come back, you know, it's not like I disappeared and came back. That is the challenge. And there's so many ways to do it. There's so many things you can do. I mean, there's nothing Things to, there's, there's so many ways, there's so many things you can do that won't cost you a lot of money, but guarantees that you don't disappear completely from the cycle of the consumer simply because you don't have brands. You, do, you don't have enough brands, not that you don't have brands, simply because you don't have enough brands. And that's what your brand must look out for. Um, that Those are my thoughts around it. I, I, I don't subscribe to if you're, because you're not out of the market, you still exist in the market, just that demand is very high. That's what you're saying. And we know why. We know that, look, one day the ports will be eased off. We know that one day um, product supply will decrease quickly. We know that one day you'll be able to buy enough raw material to come in. And if you know that, you can't just, you know, they, they, they say you prepare for war when there's peace. You don't buy your machines for war when you're fighting the war. We tend to market and prepare for war when we're fighting the war. That's when we fight the war. You own the minds of consumers before you have the pro So I would do differently, think about what are the minimum thing, what minimum thing can I do as a brand or communications owner to ensure that I do not dis completely disappear from the minds of the consumer since the product still exists? And if we do that, then there's a chance that when we get our acts together fully from a supply standpoint, um, we will succeed or win. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Kachi. I don't know if Mr. Jibarade wants to take a stab at this question. Um, I know this is also your um, product segment, so you might want to also give some form of um, advice on this. Well, uh, unfortunately, when my first talk, I don't speak again. That was what <laughs> I meant. Okay, so, uh, all right. Thank you very much, Dr. Kachi. Um, so we have a question for LA here, um, also from Abi Sodun um, Oshikoya. She says, is there a framework for understanding consumers better? Um, because we know that you need to understand consumers first before you can start to connect with them. So is there any framework you want to um, prefer or suggest to, to everybody? Um, because I believe that this is a learning platform for everyone. Well, I mean, thank you. I mean, there are no hard and fast rules. I think the important thing is that any organization uh, should always, you know, uh, have things in place to have feedback from consumers more than anything else. And able to feed that into whatever it is that they do. Um, there are traditional ways of doing that. You can commission studies. I mean, I mean that you, they, they, you can do the link test even before you do your communication to know this message that I'm about to take out. You know, will it really resonate with the people? Um, and sometimes it's just your gut, you know, feel, so to say, in terms of what you know 
a body consumer um, and you know what you what you have you know to offer. Uh, but things are even better today. You can also do social listening. I mean, you can you can get you can take a stab in terms of what are people talking about. Um, from what they're talking about, how do those things relate to your line of business and the things that you do? Uh, where you have you know, serious concern, I mean, the, the most important thing to do is that you actually you know, go out of your mission studies to know, on, to understand better you know, how the consumers you know, see the issues, see your brand and what matters to them, and, and, uh, and, and see how that can help you in, in doing what you have to do. But it's not saying that it will always be right all the time. Sometimes you miss it. Sometimes Sometimes you actually go there with a particular and you, you know, you get something else entirely. I'll give an example. Um, we all remember MT Mamana Boy. Um, the intent of the world is getting better. Now we can communicate with one another and all that and all that. It was never intended that there would be anything about any gender being promoted about other. And there were studies. I sat in on those studies. We had um, focus, focus groups, we had all sorts of things. And nothing like that ever came up. Um, so when it came out of the woodwork, so to say, it was you know a big surprise. Um, and a humanity client agency is a different thing entirely. But is that it is okay to always have the 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 in place, you know, to listen to consumers. Um, again, you don't want to be held uh, uh, into in action, you know, out of fear of, you know, what the consumers are all thinking, because again, there might be danger in there. Uh, when you have um, an overabundance of that, remember what they said about, um, about Henry Ford, that um, if he asked the consumer in you know, exactly what they wanted, they won't ask for the, you know, the more tea, they're probably asking for a different kind of carriage, uh, stronger horses and stuff like that. So it's a balance of sorts. So we want to listen to them. We also want to trust a bit of what we know about our industry for us to be able to channel things properly. But I can't say here and there that oh, this is a framework that we have to work for everybody. I think what you need to do is you have to invest in, you know, in, 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 in consumer research, knowing more about the consumers, knowing more about what they're doing, you know, and seeing how you can feed that into what you do so that I can also do your own research and development internally. And more than anything else, the world is better today. Social listening can actually help you to know exactly a lot of things. And it's not everything that you hear in that social world that really, really get you worried because sometimes you'll make mistakes based on that. People, things come up and, you know, in no time they can just sizzle up. If you act too seriously on some of those things also, they can lead you into trouble. I mean, that is the thing uh, about as, they, uh, as we get uh, consumer uh, uh, insights and all that. But it's important that we know how consumers are thinking and take them serious. Thank you very much, sir. Um, we have a, a couple of questions here, about five questions um, at the moment. So there was one um, that was asked by Usman Abubakar about what influences consumer consumption habits. And I see Dr. Kachi's comments here talking about the environment, the finances, the current need, and this love for the brand. So do you want to elaborate on this a little bit more? I think we've talked a lot about it and what drives consumer, consumer, what influences it. Sometimes your environment, just basically how you feel at that point in time, your finances, um, what can I afford often drives. I mean, you know, I love, I love to have a Bugatti today, but clearly I cannot afford it unless Larry buys me one. So if I can't <laughs> afford it, I may love it, but that's what it is. It ends there. Um, so it's about your finances, your state of health, the environment, what kind of messaging you see, what happens in store. But sometimes you go into a shop, you want to buy um, this chocolate. But when you get on the shelf, you see three and see one that is doing buy one, two, get one free, and you buy that. Or you see one that the packaging just looks different. I say, oh, let me try it. So at the end of the day, what the, the, my guidance is always, we are all consumers. What makes us buy things is what makes every consumer act the way they act. So if I'm not feeling too good, there are times you don't dress well. You don't, the, what is bothering you is let me get well. So your environment, communication, what happens in store, your finances, your state of well-being, um, government policy, something as mundane as, oh, they're kidnapping everybody every day could make you simply know what to go and buy something. Let me just stay at home. Let me save my money because I don't know what happened tomorrow. These things drive um, um, consumer connection with brands and what they do. All right. Thank you very much, sir. We have um, five more questions here, and I can also see um, messes and still raised. Um, so the next question is, how can premium brands continue to retain their consumers in the midst of stiff competition? Mr. Ajibarade, please, you want to take a stab at that question? Um, how do you retain your, so how, do, how will brands continue to retain their consumers in the midst of stiff competition? 
Okay, thanks for that question, Ola. Um, and I think it's important to underscore something that is very, very, um, you know, common in companies. You, you must, you know, decide where you're going. You can't have premium brands that you are putting significant volume on top of it. And I think that's a mistake that we do all the time. Uh, we make all the time. So um, you have a brand that is premium and uh, the, the, the category the, the category of people, the social economicals that you are targeting cannot really afford the kind of volume you're placing on there. And that is where the pressure comes in. And people start asking significantly that you need to start extending, start selling in where you're not supposed to be selling. If it's a premium brand, it's a focused brand. There are people that you are targeting and those people you have to focus on them and don't get the will. And I will give you a class classic example of what is happening on a brand called Schweppes within my portfolio. So Schweppes is our premium portfolio. And when we started, we started having, you know, we started small, we started building it. Then suddenly something happened and there are demands that we need to do millions of, millions of cases on it. Then, you know, there were conversations around derailing the brand proposition. And then that is where the pressure comes in and you start seeing some very, very, um, um, request that you know we at the end of the day um, erode the equity that you are building for the brand. So for a premium brand to remain relevant, one focus, understand that it's premium and you are building is a journey. It's not it's not a sprint. It's marathon. You build it on a gradual basis. You you are building your equity together. You are building your volume at the same time, but you are very very careful where you trade so that you don't begin to actually erase um, um, the good work that you're doing with your hands. So um, I, I would leave it at that to say be focused, don't be derailed, then keep, continue the premium, you know, um, investment that you're putting behind the brand. And over a period of time, it will begin to play out. And I'll give you a classic example. Jameson is the classic example in this market. Jameson started very, very small. Today, they've grown to become one of the fastest growing spirit brands in Nigeria. But when they started, they could, they could hardly, you know, sell 100 cases or thereabouts. But they started, they were focused, they were disciplined around it, and they kept doing things that actually take the brands to the next place. So you build awareness, you build, you know, resonance with consumer over a period of time, then you start ripping the volume and, uh, over, over that period of time. That's, where, that's what I would say about it. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I would like to direct the next question to Mr. Larry Adisa. Um, so there's a question here about how do we engage in terms of experiential engagement in the new normal of social distancing? So there are restrictions around um, social gatherings um, and large gatherings. So how, should, how can brands still um, have experiential engagement with consumers in the face of the new normal um, but bring around social distancing? Well, thank you very much. I mean, that is um, uh, one big question for the experiential industry in particular. Um, they, were, they were one of the bad hit, you know, um, all of last year and even better part of where we are today. Yes, things are easing up a little bit. So, you know, but even at that, there's a limit to how much of that you can do. Um, so what really hit them was the fact that that industry, you know, um, hadn't taken digital transformation seriously enough. Uh, and I think it's very important for every business today, uh, as much as possible. Yes, you may say that we look at the composition of the Nigerian population, you know, and those of us who are, you know, um, who have access to it might be, you know, smaller in number compared to the general masses as it were. But even the general masses, you know, over time, you know, things will get easier for you to acquire some of those things going forward. But let's even look at some of us. So I think the most important thing, first and foremost, is how do you invest in digital transformation? How can I curate experiences you know, that can work you know, online and offline? In other words, can I create content that can work online? And can I support that content with stuff you know, uh, where I can use? I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a big, big, big you know, uh, uh, surge in logistics business in Nigeria today. Uh, how can I plug into that, you know, to do what I have to do? How can I use e-commerce to support whatever to do? Uh, and if you can plug into, you know, the, the, the logistics thing and you have enough content online that can engage people, 
uh, that can take them through certain things and do demos and stop the lack of that. Maybe you can have a semblance of what you used to have, you know, in real in the real world. Um, but more importantly, is that now that things are also getting eased, we also need to start looking to how you can scale things down. Um, so the days of big activations and whatever and all those things may be, you know, gone for now. But can I scale down the experiences? But can I make them quality experiences more than any other thing? Um, and, and because for a country like Nigeria, that is where we are. The fact that there are government regulations that actually you know, ease people coming together, those that are the number, but making you know, also so whether I'm seeing it online or I've seen it offline, the, the experience must be of high quality so that people can actually you know relate with it and it means something to them and it's relevant to the brand in question more than any other thing. Um, it's going to take a while, but I think the first point that like I raised earlier for me is digital transformation and how you can actually you know uh, get uh, people. To plug into you know the experiences without necessarily feeling it physically all the time because who knows where we will be uh, when the next pandemic comes around because scientists are telling us another one may come um, but this is good training for the future thank you very much sir i don't know if chinedu wants to take a stab so somebody had asked a question around experiential and also how do you engage with consumers um when you have shortage in um maybe stock um do you also want to i, I think um, you can also take a stab at that please Okay, thank, thanks, Omaluwa. I think that the, 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 like Dr. Kachi pointed out, you don't go to sleep because you don't have products. Because by the time you're back to the market, the consumer may have switched. And you know, these days it just takes trying a new product that is good um, to switch. And I have all kinds of personal experience where the product wasn't available. I tested the alternative and I never went back to the old one because it just, just serves me well. So for companies, what should they be doing? I think that things around, depending on the kind of products you're selling, things around what sort of, can I help the consumer? So first is how do I keep the consumer engaged and how do I help the consumer make a buying decision before that buying, before that actual buying happens? So for, so, so if you, if first, if you're, if you're doing something like a paint, there are all kinds of tools now where you can maybe have a feel of what the colors will look like, if you know what you want to paint. Um, if you do have an event, if you think of an event, you know, depending on what the product position you know to do, and um, can I help people have a platform where they can begin to have an idea of the cost of that event? Uh, well, of course, with my product in there as part of the event, <clears throat> things you're going to use if it's a drink or if whatever it is, and people just so I have a platform to start engaging them. They have an idea of what they're going to spend, what the party will look like. Now, also there are all kinds of gamification tools, some of which we offer that you can use to keep the consumers engaged online. Now that a lot of people are online, keep them engaged. Now, another idea is also some online events that you can do, some online competition. Of course, the the focal point is not to sell more because you don't even have products, but you're looking at brand engagement, top of the mind awareness being in the consumer's mind, being in the face of the consumer. So some online competition that just gets people excited and the things you're going to spend will be next to nothing. Gift items, very basic, but just to keep the consumer excitement going. Some gamification tools, what's up do, and platforms that will enable the consumer um, to, to something that will impact the buying decision for them to begin to see so that when they are ready to make that purchase, they're already, already here, you've been in their face, they already have an idea of, okay, um, if I'm gonna do a party of this size and I need uh, five cartons of Coca-Cola, what other things do I need? Do I already have an idea of the budget? If Coca-Cola provides me a platform to be able to estimate that, and of course, putting five cartons of, or five pairs of Coca-Cola, why not? So when it's time for me to do that, I have been engaging with the brand and it's very easy for me to make that buy addition of buying that, buying that product. Um, so it's important that there has to be a platform to keep the engagement when the product is not available. Like I said, I've had all kinds of experiences. Personally, it's products that I use, my family and also you know, uses, that I got it, I checked, it's not available. I went to another shop, it's not available. I decided to defer the buying decision. Can we get not available? I said, there was alternative. And as soon as I tested it, that was it. All right, thank you very much, Nedun. So um, three things I hear you say clearly, there's a share of mine, the share of wallet, and share of the shelf. So you need to ensure that your products are available and if they are not you need to find ways to keep engaging with them gamification is one way to keep that top of mind awareness and then we can talk after now um, around this my next question is directed to mr um Dari kafar um so the question is how is value defined from the point of view of the consumer and how do marketing professionals define value 
And how do you come to a meeting point that it becomes a win-win? So this question borders around um, value creation, value definition for the consumers and also for the brands. And then how do you find a point of convergence that you can now say there's a win-win for the brand and also for the consumer? Right. Thanks, Ola. Um, I think for me, um, in layman's language or layman's um, response, um, for me, value, it's um, an emotional thing. What does a, a, what does a consumer get from the, the, the brand? So value can be functional and you take it from functional to being an emotional. So there is this feeling, for example, if you have a bath with a cooling soap, um, the value it gives you is you feel refreshed, basically. So that's the value you get from it. And to what extent are you willing to pass away your money for that value you're getting? Um, uh, we, we, we know in the past few few months, it's been, been COVID-19 uh, pandemic in, um, across the world. People seem seems to be frustrated. People seems to be um, the, the, their emotion has gone really low. But people, in order to raise their um, their emotions to feel it better, some of some of them probably go um, engage in some activities that increase their um, their emotion, like playing games or playing games. So, so that's the value you get from the game is to lift your spirits basically. So you get into gaming, or for example, you go for example, you you you, you buy a product that um, um, your 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 a product makes you feel better. Um, why some of us buy a, a, a type of perfume is for us to give us that feeling of confidence. You wear a perfume and it keeps you confident. That's the value you get from that. And for us, for, for a marketer, the value, what you get from that basically is you are giving a product that meets consumers' needs, uh, meeting them at their emotional needs at, at, at that point, be it functional or emotional. You are meeting them at their needs and they are getting the money for value for whatever they're passing value for money whatever they're passing the amount they're passing up for that value they are getting value for it so um is it is it refreshment uh you, you uh, like for example you quench your test with uh, coca-cola so you feel test you take your coca-cola and you feel refreshed definitely you wear your perfume you feel confidence it's giving you value for that and what to what extent or uh, what amount of money can you part away for that to get that value so from the consumer point of view you are meeting their emotional or functional needs by providing value and from the from the marketing point of view is that at that at, at that value you are providing consumers what what are they willing to part to get the value you are getting them so at, at that point, you are giving there is a win-win in terms of what you have been provided and what is being get is being gotten. So, if your customers is satisfied with the value you are providing, you are giving them, they are willing to part away with the value placed on that product or service. At the, and and then for you as as a marketing personnel or you for you as a brand, you are getting the required revenue for that value. I think I think I think that I want to sum it up there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dari, for, for that brilliant um, answer. We have one other question here before we take the parting shot from our panelists. Um, this question says, how do, we, how do we increase brand connection with touch points for influencers? We also know that influencers are critical um, in the value chain, um, but they don't belong as consumers or even um, sometimes trade partners, but they, they play in that value chain. Um, I don't know if any of our distinguished panelists would like to take a stab at this question. It's saying, how do we increase brand connection with influencers um, for brands? I don't know if any, any, any of our panelists would like to take a stab at that question. Okay, I mean, a uh, quick one for me. Um, uh, it, it's something that uh, I've observed. Um, and the thing is that when trends come, uh, some are here to stay. Um, but but what, what the one thing you don't want to do as the owner of the brand is to lose control. Um, as much as the influencers are there and they play a role in terms of entertaining people, but their primary reason for being is in that degree. It was never in their DNA to say, let me sell for you. Uh, but we've seen an opportunity for them to sell. But in seeing that, in doing that, um, I think the, what I've seen, this is my observation, I'm happy I have a lot of people in marketing here, uh, is that we're ceding control to the, to the influencers in a way. Uh, they're bringing their own brand values. They're bringing what you know what they're all about, and they're replicating from one brand to the other what they start. I give an example. Uh, you see this. So there's a brother Shaggy, and brother Shaggy is here, there, is everywhere. And I can't tell one brother Shaggy apart from the brother Shaggy I see in any other communication. As a matter of fact, I get clouded by his personality to the point that I lose the message. So that's what I mean. That there's nothing using them. They have a platform. They have an audience. 
But I think it's important that we don't lose control. And that's what I see going on where we are today. Um, as much as people want to be entertained, and yes, they can be entertained. I mean, that not, nobody goes home to say, I want to see your ad, really. Um, you know, we must be smart enough to say, along with whatever is entertaining, there is messaging that is relevant, that can actually add to the bottom line for me, because that's why you're putting money behind it. Um, where we are today is that these guys are getting stronger and command more value. And, you know, um, as much as, yes, the client has the right to do as he or she wishes with the brand, um, we will lose if you don't bring people who are the experts in communication to work with these guys. Uh, as much as they have their own brand, they have their own speak, so that they can be guided. It's about being guided so that you don't lose the investment that you're putting behind these influencers, as it were. So losing control is you know, something we need to watch out for um, as much as um, the influencers are here, as, as long as we you know, operate in this world, they're here with us and we have to be with them. I mean, that's my take on it, really. Okay. Thank you very um, much. Just give me two seconds on, on what he said. And I think what Larry said is brilliant. And I, I want to make a few points. The first thing is, look at all the brands that have been around, around 50, 100 years, the great brands, you know, they don't work on with influencers. They're, they, they're not, you know, you don't remember Coca-Cola and think of any influencer or Pepsi and think of an influencer. Maybe you see Messi now in, when he's around sports. You don't think about Pampers and think of an influencer. Neither do you think about, the point is not to lose control. It's like a fad now. You see these guys is doing 10 different ads and you run away. But the point is about if the fundamentals of your brands don't connect with the consumers, the influencer won't be. It's short term because you can influence on your brands. Be move, move. By the time you do it three or four times, like Larry says, you, you're wondering, okay, what is this guy be? It is important that the influencer is added support, does not take away from the call to building your brand. And that's what marketers should focus on. The other point I want to make is on your question around value and how there's convergence. I'll just make one point. The value um, the value is driven by what the consumer believes is value, not what you as the person sells. So when you talk of convergence, it's not about, I'm not, the consumer is not there to make you happy. The consumer is king. You need to understand what he believes is value from a product solution standpoint, whether it's emotional or functional, and the value from a monetary standpoint, what is willing to pay for it. That is the only point of convergence. If you're waiting for what you like, what he should like, then I think you're feeling as a marketing person. The question then is, if this is what the guy wants and this is what he's willing to pay for, how do I, as a production person, marketing person, organization, deliver that expectation in the price range he wants? That is where you call, I don't call it, it's not convergence. It's about how do I then meet that need? Because at the end of the day, our job is to meet consumer expectation. That is what a brand does. And the value we get from it is what we can derive from meeting that need. That is what your brand equity is. And if you understand that part, then it's not about what you think, it's about what the man thinks. The consumer always remember is king. Thank you. Um, Olas, just just a few comments. And Oga, I take uh, I take excuse for this on on influencer and i think larry made made a very very valid point on control because these guys are not lawyer and the earlier you understand as marketer the better but again the challenge that i also tell marketer is your job is to begin to build brands that are bigger than these influencers such that the influence influencer themselves are the one you know dying to be a part of it and i can tell you for sure when we were doing coke coke studio you have a lot of requests from from artists for sending mails to us to say hey we want to be part of this journey so uh, that is that is the job that we need to do as marketer build equity for your brand build resonance for your brand amongst your consumers such that you can then begin to command uh, you are the one that determine what you want to use influencer for they are not the one actually flipping back or uh, just as what we are seeing today uh, and i'll give you a classic example I used um, what you call Bonner Boy on, uh, on, on EPL, EPL campaign. Before the contract went up, it jumped on Pepsi. So, so anything can happen. So these guys are not lawyer. The earlier you understand that you need to build a strong brand and not depend on them, the better for, for any market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Coach. Um, so somebody has a question here saying, um, we've, it looks like we focus more around B2C for the major part of this um, conversation that are there strategies businesses should be looking at or brands should be looking at that are B2B to, B to B focused? Um, so Dr. Kachi, I know you, um, so I'll, I'll push this question to both Dr. Kachi and also to LA to please take a stab at that and I will take your parting shots. 
so Dr. Kachi, I would hand over to you, and then um, Mr. Larry would also. Thank you. Um, marketing to consumers, and we talked about this because we're talking about fast consumer goods. When you do B2B, you're not really talking to you're talking to a, a, a different kind of consumer. The principles remain the same, but the question is that look, so if you're selling um, to an organization, you need to understand where their pain points are and create solutions that meet those pain points. In, in my experience with B2B businesses, the key drivers would normally be costs when you talk of value and the entire supply value chain, ensuring that look from A to B, it doesn't run out, you don't run out, you know, there's no out of stocks. And how do I drive down the supply chain costs? Most B2B businesses. How do I ensure the products exist at the point in time? How do I ensure it delivers what the service should do? But how do I ensure that within the value chain, I get the best value out of it? It's a bit different, but again, the principles remain the same. Who is your, your B2B consumer? Who is your business, the business consumer? And if you understand that guy, what are his needs? And how do I ensure that I deliver around those things he or she expects the organization? We spend time on consumer goods because B2C is probably what most people look at from a consumer standpoint. They are individual consumers. And you know, but from the B2B space, the underlying principles remain the same. If you're supplying chemicals to a chemical company, you need to understand, okay, what do they need? What are their pain points? What are their supply challenges? What is their, what is what does your product do for them? Does it have, you know, and in doing that, develop a product package or portfolio that meets that need. You're not going to go on TV to go and talk to them you know, about buying hydroxy peroxide if you don't need it. But it's understanding where do, where do I connect with them? So we talked about connecting on TV and video. Maybe where you connect them is through trade fairs. Maybe where you connect them is through um, um, industry, industry groups. Then you have to play in that place. It may be industry meetings, committee of um, soap makers. But you need to understand them where they play their environment and then drive your brands to meet that need. So the principles in identifying what their needs are, their gaps are, how you connect to them are different. You're not going to be talking to somebody who makes Boeing 747 engines and be putting on Facebook, I have engine parts for Boeing 747. It, it, it doesn't make sense. But if you're going to an aviation show and you're talking about the speed of combustible speed of these engines and the force saving efficiency, then you understand where I can connect with them. It's in the aviation show. And so the thank principle you, don't change, much, the connection points may differ. Thank, thank you very you much. Very much. Uh, Ellie, please um, give it a shot so that we can take um, the... Okay, quick one. I'll take it from the other side of it now. I mean, I think Kachi has done a good job of you know, integrity of how uh, uh, B2Bs you know, uh, relate with one another. The other thing for me, which is very important where things are, are headed now, is alignment of values. You know, yes, you may not be able to choose who you work with all the time, uh, but you have to, you know, if you communicate something by yourself as a brand, so let I'm Coca-Cola, you're here now, uh, this is what I stand for. Um, there are demands on us around the world today in terms of who your partners are as well. Uh, are they doing things that negate what you stand for? Um, it seems to become very relevant, you know, because now it's not about just how big the brand is, it's about, about brand behavior. Uh, these guys, and so that's why constantly in the U.S. we keep finding cases of Nike or their sweatshops in Asia or whatever, all those things. Those things are important, you know, um, who are my partners? Who are my key partners? And do their values align with my values more than any other thing, apart from the fact that I want to drive down the cost of doing business and all those other things. So I think for me, it may not be so big in this part of the world, but this is where we need to start thinking about, you know, what we do. So when you stand for something as a brand, are you able to drive it down the, you know, the, the, the supply, you know, the, the, the chain? Uh, yes, the people I work with also believe in the things that I stand for, and those things matter. You know, they matter not just for the pocket, also for you know for the for the for the society at large and the things that I all subscribe to. I think for now that's what I'll say. Thank you very much, L H. So this to be um, the final question, and we would use this question to take our final thoughts from all of the panelists. Mm -hmm. And I will start with Mr. Derek Kafar. So the question says, um, what are the key lessons learned from COVID? And then what's the best way for businesses to navigate and stay flexible with the ever-changing policies? So I would use this question to take our last and final remarks before we, before we take, um, our, um, we just take a poll to get a feedback from all of our participants. So Mr. Ludari Kapar, um, you can please um, give us your parting remarks on this. So Thanks, Ola. Um, and how do we stay flexible? Thank right. you. Thank you so much, Ola. I think one thing COVID has done for um, um, done or it has changed the consumers, uh, changed our behavior basically, behavior to um, how we socialize. Uh, it has reduced um, 
level of love interaction, um, even in terms of physical interaction. Uh, it has also, also changed the media landscape in terms of how do we communicate. And most mainly for, for marketeers, how do you get your message to your, your intended consumers? Um, so for, for with COVID, the key lesson from COVID is that um, it has also strengthened the, uh, the prominence of digital media. Digital media has becoming a bit more prominent now than it used to be. The growth has moved even higher and not beyond that, beyond even in, in terms of adoption, it has also increased uh, the level of activities on social on, on digital media. So uh, you see the key learnings now is taking uh, our marketing campaign from being um, being off, off, offline to taking it online. And you'll see that there have been so many um, 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 uh, uh, new ways or new initiative in communicating so uh, beyond having to um, do um, things on twitter sending twitter um, um, uh, messages or sending emails there are apps now that also gives on um, real-time interaction and also in terms of commerce um, in terms of buying and selling buying and selling no longer be the traditional way of going to the market and pick up of, of the, um, uh, um, a product consumers now do a lot of e-commerce e e so e the, the effects of covid has changed the landscape um, from being traditional, it has gone to even online and digital. So e-commerce is grow has grown, is growing. In terms of um, uh, the, 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 the logistic business has also increased also. In terms of marketing, marketing has now moved from being the offline to being digital. So digital act um, activities are now increasing like, tremendously. So, and not only is it increasing, there are also initiatives. There are also um, there are better ways of interaction on this. So um, that has been the learning and, and, and this, all, this, all these new learnings has come to stay. Um, and then also for us, what we need to understand as marketers is how do we just, how do we manage both the new new normal and also what it used to be uh, in order to keep, while we are ad addressing the new adopters of the new normal, we don't lose sight of those, uh, the old people that, the older ones are used to the old way of doing things. That's my take on that. Thank you very much, Dari. We really appreciate it. Um, Mr. Biodo Day. Um, so the question again is what are the lessons um, from COVID and how do we navigate business and stay flexible with the ever-changing policies and business environments? Okay, um, thanks for that uh, question. And uh, just like Larry has said, um, COVID you know, came to challenge a lot of wrong assumptions that we had about running businesses. Um, a lot of uh, companies out today are changing their operating models um, because you know, it's been very, very apparent that you can do business in a very more efficient way. And for marketers, um, I think one thing I will leave with everybody is about, and I think Dr. Kachi mentioned it, is about, think about value. Everything you do, think about value that you want to give to consumers. And that is um, the lesson that COVID has actually you know, taught us, that consumers now are more very, very attuned to brands that gives them value than any other. And um, I think the second thing on that is, I will challenge marketers, um, those on this line, and those that will probably will, will, will be hearing this or watching this uh, recording later, to always think about marketing from three end. One, what is now, which is something that we are doing currently, um, and what is new, and uh, what is next. Those three end are very, very critical, because if you think ahead like that, probably you will have been a two step ahead of COVID. Now that all of us are running to e-commerce, uh, probably you will have set up those, those companies that were already on e-commerce were just actually capturing value during this period. And then, you know, we are to, today we are talking about augmented reality. We're talking about you know, virtual reality. We're talking about um, blockchain. We're talking about, you know, um, drone, drone delivery. And these are things that are actually springing up that you need to start stepping in as market here. It doesn't mean that you're going to put a ton of your money on it, but you start experimenting so that it doesn't catch you unaware like what happened during COVID. Those are the lessons and those are the things that I actually want to part with, uh, with, with the people on the call. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Jibarodi. Um, Ellie, um, over to you, sir. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And uh, yes, a whole lot of lessons from COVID. Uh, and I, I wouldn't want to repeat what's been said. But more importantly is the fact that uh, we shouldn't know that the, uh, the, the, the pandemic, um, you know, has empowered people a bit more in terms of um, their consciousness of where they are, their environment, and their demands, as it were. 
Um, so from a communication point of view, um, it's important that we think first and foremost in terms of how what we're doing can be relevant to their world. Um, like I said earlier, there's a sense of insecurity around the world and Nigeria is not in any way excluded. Um, and if that is where we fact, as a matter of fact, even worse in Nigeria, I understand the, the unemployment rate is about over 30% or thereabout, uh, which is huge by any standard. So coupled with all the other things that we are contending with, um, social political issues, which I can't go into all the details, we all know we live with these things. Um, so the consumer today needs to be reassured, even in our, you know, the way we deal with them. Uh, uh, so there is a whole lot of things to be learned that we don't want to add to their pressure. Uh, that's one lesson. And if you're not adding to their pressure and they can see relevance in what you do, and you know, as regards their own lives, as it were, then we might be in a better position to do things better. I mean, I had an example. The other thing I'd like to say before, um, as a parting shot for me, is that uh, I think as a country, generally speaking, uh, and it's a good forum to talk about that, there was a whole lot of knee jack you know, reaction to COVID-19. And there wasn't so much in terms of tangibles or what we can say case studies of I did X, Y, Z from different brands. I think there was a lot about survival more than any other thing. Um, yeah, it might be the state of the economy and all that, but I, when you look at other clients and things, I'll give you an example. I was going through some, some agencies real, uh, a brand called Capri Sun, not Capri Stone that we have here. Uh, what the guys did was because there was a big challenge with kids, um, Water fountains, you know, will be prohibited for now because of COVID-19 in places. Uh, so kids can't take water from water fountains. So what did this do? What they did was to put the, you know, to, to, to create um, uh, pouches of water, you know, instead of their juices in the pouches and so that kids can still drink water. And even in communicating that to the consumer, it was a case of apologizing to the kids because that's no fun. Kids want to take something sweet. Now they have to take water. So they have to apologize to them firstly, sorry, we're giving you water. So they Parents, now this is about relevance. Parents are concerned that they're having child or not. So I, I, this level of innovation is almost non-existent, so to say, you know, when you look at our environment. I don't know what is the cause of this, but I think if there's anything at all, we need to take something for this COVID-19 and say, how can we be relevant to people's lives? How can we do things that people can appreciate for what, as, as a business, as a brand? That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, sir. Um, and lastly, to Dr. Kachi, um, your party shots, um, lessons from COVID and how do we stay relevant and flexible in the ever-changing business environment? Um, thank you very much. And everybody has, I mean, I, I've been taking notes interestingly on what everybody's saying, and there's a lot of learning for me. Um, but a few points. The first thing is, like, and I keep saying the consumer is king. Everything we do and everything we do in COVID must be built around, have learned had to be built around how to meet that consumer needs. Be it, um, we talk about oh, everybody going into um deliveries so i mean for the first time you saw an explosion in mobile deliveries because we couldn't move around so people started shopping from markets to now it's now a norm now everybody nobody's now nobody's afraid to put something on a delivery bag to go deliver to you from food and stuff because you're not used to it you're not used to it. so it was meeting a consumer need i was one who was very skeptical before that i could ever buy fresh food from someone who delivered from same man to market Today I do it and I buy fruits now and just order it and they deliver it. So it created another ecosystem in terms of delivery. So first of all, the consumer is king. Your job is to understand, like, like Biodo said, what is now, what is new, what has the environment created, what is next thing and fix it. The other point around looking at what um, Larry said, creatively dialing up consumer connections within the context where you found yourselves. Um, Larry talked about what um, um, Capri Sun did. I've seen it, I saw a lot of ads during COVID strategically around even McDonald's, you know, you cannot, or in South Africa, I think Burger King had, McDonald's had an issue and Burger King said, um, I, I can't remember, it's something about, we're sorry about our partners, but we'll support them. Something around that, that builds around saying, look, we're still in this together. It was a pawn, but it worked. But the third most important thing I'll say, so you need to create competition that mirrors the reality of the time and that builds something bigger than just selling. Um, locally, somebody did something a bit about it, Larry Lacassera. I know they did a lot about um, trying to say we'll get out of this. There's a campaign they ran that I was quite impressed in that it was around these two will pass or something along those lines that it was around music and trying to communicate to people that anyhow, at the end of the day, we'll get out of this. So playing into the fears of, fears of people around you, but also telling them that, look, we're with you through this. That's in communication. 
The last point, more importantly, is about flexibility. It's what COVID taught me is that, look, the most intelligent marketing person will tell you he knows what will happen in one year, two years, a lie. It's about understanding that you have plans that constantly focus on meeting the consumer needs and is malleable and flexible, but focus on achieve, achieving that goal. If we do that, then somehow we'll survive. We'll survive through this COVID and next COVID. And one point, remember, this is one COVID. There'll be other pandemics. There'll be even more critical pandemics that will change the way business is done. So we must now be in the mode that we can also change the way we approach meeting consumer needs in the short and long term. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. All I can say is, wow, it's, I think it's been mind-blowing. Um, we've, we've crossed the two-hour line already, and um, I don't think I'm bored yet. Uh, but I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our panelists. We have, um, I'd like to just talk briefly about what we do at Sproxil. And then we also have a, we have, um, we'd like um, our participants to please take our poll just to give us feedback about this, um, about this webinar. So quickly around what we do at Sproxil, we are a consumer engagement and um, brand engagement solutions company. Um, so at the moment, we have some solutions that border around both um, helping brands to engage with their consumers and also with their trade partners. So please feel free to reach out to us um, after, this, um, after this webinar. Um, uh, we will drop our mobile numbers and um, you can also Google Sproxil Nigeria and then you can reach out to us if you need us to develop any customized solution for you. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. We have a poll. Please, let's take the poll. We'd like to say a big thank you to all of our participants and also to all of our panelists for making our time. Um, some of these panelists had to make our time at very short notices. And we thank you for making this um, webinar a very fantastic one. The conversations have been very, very mind blowing, exciting, and there are lots of takeaways um, from this poll. Um, so Joanne, please, you can put the poll up now. And so everyone can just uh, provide the feedback. Thank you very much. I don't know if Chinedun would like to give a formal vote of thanks um, as we round up. Thanks, Ola. I, I, it's been a very wonderful time and we just great time of learning, listening to these seasoned experts, top executives in the industry, share their views on a whole range of issues around consumer engagement. I want to say a big thank you to our panelists for making our time. I know this came at a very big sacrifice for most of you. You had to join me in the last minute to make this happen. We do not take this for granted. I want to say thank you. And thank you again for, for making our time to be here and for sharing your knowledge with us, you know, in a manner that we we've, we've haven't had top executives like this come together to share the perspective on consumer engagement in light of our time. To be honest, I don't like hearing the word new normal, uh, but unfortunately, because I just can't wait to stop wearing masks, I can't wait to go back to our, um, our former way of life. But uh, like like the panelists, some of the panelists mentioned, maybe there could be something else coming. So we have to be ready as business leaders and as managers to respond to things as they come and be ready to provide services to the consumers in a manner that it provides significant benefits and delivers value to them. Of course, co of course, cost efficiently and the business is out there to make money and remain profitable. So thank you and to all our participants. We want to say a big thank you for staying true. It's been, we've gone our uh, time. Where I think we, we scheduled this to do last for an hour and a half, but we just you give or take, depending on how the questions go, you will get to us. Now we're over two hours by 10 minutes. We want to say thank you for staying with us and for participating. Like I highlighted earlier, this is the maiden edition. There will be other webinars coming subsequently in the year. Of course, focusing most likely on other industries of interest. So thank you for being here. And um, please feel free to reach out to us on any other questions you may have. You can check out our website for the things we do. And we're really available to provide answers and be of service to you. Thank you, everyone. And do enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye, thank everyone. Thank you very much. Bye, bye everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Sir.